Greetings and love, everybody. Greetings, greetings. Parigani. Parigani. <laughs> Shalom. Hello, now we are live. Welcome everybody. It is a pleasure to have all of you here to celebrate this uh, day of Martin Luther King. My name is Odilia Okonga, the founder of the African School Netherlands. And I'm here with my colleagues, my teammates, Ishmael, who always does the background uh, IT work and is managing this Zoom connection now. I'm here also with Troni Ingati, who faithfully and efficiently organizes our activities by going through every detail meticulously and who helped a great deal to organize this event and Helga. Welcome all to this transnational Martin Luther King celebration. I will start with a powerful quote from Gugi Wathiongo, who continues to give us, who continues to give us as African people service by encouraging and fighting for the development and growth of our African mother tongues. And he says, our lives are a battlefield on which is fought a continuous war between the forces that are pledged to confirm our humanity and those determined to dismantle it. Those who strive to build a protective wall around it and those who wish to pull it down. Those who seek to mold it and those committed to breaking it up. Those who aim to open our eyes to make us see the light and look to tomorrow. And those who wish to lull us into closing our eyes. That is Ngugi Wathiongo. So for those of you who don't know, Martin Luther King is a special day dedicated for service unto others. And this is the service Ngugi Wathiongo is giving us in Africa, fighting for our languages, to develop our languages, our mother tongue, and let it grow. There is also this African proverb that goes like this. Lack of knowledge is darker than the night. African school has chosen to serve by opening our community's eyes and making them see the light look to tomorrow. We serve our community by offering knowledge through education that continues to remain elusive, hence pushing them into the darkest night. This knowledge includes African history, African languages like Swahili and workshops aimed at restoration of our African identity and dignity in the diaspora. We also are busy developing Swahili books, African storybooks, and creating an e-learning platform to make this special education easily accessible to our community, not only here in Europe, but also across the Atlantic to our brothers and sisters. We are also launching a magazine to be able to speak in our own voices, tell our stories and connect with other people of African descent across the globe. That is our responsibility. It is our hope that this flicker of light will bring a new dawn to those living in a space darker than the night. We are pleased to have all of you here and we hope that by the time you leave this gathering, you will take with you the real meaning of service and make a personal decision to pass on the flame in whichever way you can, however small. Little by little, grow the bananas. That is another African proverb. So you don't need to do much. You just need to serve your, your fellow human being. I welcome you to this program and Lisbeth, is going to perform for us all the way from Suriname. Lisbeth, we appreciate you. Lisbeth is a musician. She's a music artist and producer and is very active in art and culture. All the way from Suriname. Lisbeth, welcome.
That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Very nice. <clears throat> Hey, look, can you get an applause? Yeah, that was beautiful. Yes, clap it there. Clap it up. Okay. Is she done? She's done, Adelia? Yes, yeah, she's done. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. All right, so thank you all for uh, joining in for this lovely presentation uh, where we honor Dr. Martin Luther King. My name is Haki Ami, the Success Scholar. I'm here in Baltimore, Maryland, in Tubman City on the East Coast here. So I am uh, just want to welcome you all on behalf of the Teaching Artists Institute uh, on this international day. Many people love and honor and appreciate the work of Dr. Martin Luther King. I actually met his son uh, like two years ago, and we took some pictures and had a good conversation. So. Struggle continues uh, in terms of civil rights and international rights and understanding what he meant to us and as well as his evolution. And that is essential for us because he was a man of, 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 of courage that wanted freedom for uh, his people. And so we just want to welcome you all on behalf of the Teaching Artists Institute. We are pleased to a partner, of course, with the uh, International African School, as well as later uh, the um, International Civil Rights Center and Museum out of Greensboro, North Carolina. So we, Greensboro, North Carolina. So we are grateful for that. Uh, but I hope uh, that we can get Sister up uh, now to, she's gonna actually moderate this discussion and if we have any challenges, I'll come back in uh, because she is in Ghana right now, West Africa, where she moved to uh, maybe six months ago, but she can tell you how long she uh, has lived in Ghana. She was back here in the Baltimore area for some time and she represents uh, Black Diamonds. Uh, so she's going to tell you a little bit about that, and I'll just get out of her way. So we, we will be back to share more about Teaching Artists Institute, but I want to encourage you all to go to the Facebook page uh, and share this to your, your page and other groups that so that everybody can enjoy in this international celebration and honoring of Dr. King. So Omokwele, on, Omokwele are you there? Yes, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear, loud and clear. Thumbs up if everybody can hear Onokwele. Thumbs up, thumbs up, everybody. Okay. Okay, okay, everybody can hear you. So you you got the mic, hold it down, and you're looking good over in Ghana, all that fresh sun and everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. So go ahead and flow, sister. Thank you. Yeah. All right, um, actually, I've been here for four months this week. So Haki, the last time you saw me, I was a little lighter. So I've been kissed by the sun getting all that good vitamin D here in the motherland. And I'm sending healing vibrations from the epicenter of the ancestors. I'm just minutes away from the dungeons that they transported millions of our ancestors to um, what we now call the divided states. Um, I'm so glad to be here um, as Haki said, I lived in Baltimore for quite some time, and that's when I started the Black Diamonds Girls Club, uh, actually last, last year, and, but COVID, or the year before that, actually, and then COVID-19 hit and put a, a big dent in that, but we had gotten, gotten off to a good start, but uh, just to give you a little background, just very brief background, I was a National Park Ranger right outside of Baltimore in Towson, Maryland, and I was working on a slave plantation, for real, for real. So there, it's called Hampton National Historic Site, and there for 13 years, I told the stories of our ancestors who were in bondage. And I do have a special connection with them. And my name, by the way, means, a no, well, it means truth in the language of Ga from Ghana. And I legally changed my name years ago. So 
Um, that's what I do. I tell the truth about what happened to us and our and where we are now and the greatness that we come from. So there's no shame in anything that's happened. Matter of fact, the more I learn, the more I realize what greatness I'm from. So uh, the Black Diamonds Girls Club, we're doing it here in Ghana. And as I stated earlier, I've been here for four months this week. And a month ago on December the 5th, we did our first um, outreach program. And this is something we're gonna do from now on uh, at least once a month. And then hopefully very soon we'll go twice a month to Sekandi Female Prison. It's in the Western re region of Ghana. And we have partnered with the prison now, in prisons around the world are just a, it's a bad place. And I don't need to tell you about the, the prison systems in the US for those who are in the US. And believe it or not, for those who are not in the US, you might think it's better in the US than other countries, but it's not. The majority of the people who are incarcerated in the US are black bodies. But we're talking about Ghana right now. So the women, there in Sekondi, in Sekondi um, prison. And we're gonna have some pictures of us there. There are only 20 of them. And right across the street, there, there is the male prison. There's 700 men in the male prison. But the women who are there, the 20 of them, they're not hardened criminals. Most of the women there are there because of debts. Uh, it's one woman that I, I encountered, she, she's in, in prison because she owed 20,000 Ghana CDs, which is about 3,500 CDs, and she has to spend five years in prison. There's another woman that the warden, the deputy warden told me about that her husband, uh, they broke up for a while, and then they got back together, and her boyfriend she had at the time, uh, they broke up, but when she got back to, with her husband, her, she had nothing to do with it, but her husband and some men went to her ex-boyfriend and castrated him. They put her in jail for 25 to 30 years, even though she had nothing to do with the actual castration. It was another woman that I met there who actually gave birth to the baby. And when, I, when we gave the presentation, we, we talked to them, I'm a vegan. I'm not trying to convert people to veganism, but then again, I am. But even if you're not gonna be a vegan, you should eat more vegetables. So we brought food for them. And the food that they give them in the prison yes, only amounts to one CD and 60 pesos, which is not even a dollar worth of food a day. And we brought this food and they were just so thankful. We brought sanitary pads. And this is what we'll be doing as an organization uh, for those in the community. I just met with a council of elders in a nearby village uh, where I am here at the University of Cape Coast and Capral. And we will set up a, a clubhouse there. We will make reusable sanitary pads. Uh, Ghana is ridden with trash. So we don't wanna add any more trash to that with sanitary, disposable sanitary pads. So we'll teach the women and young girls to make the reusable pads and sell them. And they'll also consume them for themselves because I'm in a rural area and many of the girls can't afford the, a pack of sa sanitary pads, which is about seven CDs, which is a little over a dollar a pack. So we'll train them. And so they'll learn that skill. We're also gonna teach them academics. Um, teach them about their history. Even though I told you we're so close to the dungeons, the average Cape Coast person, Elmina person, they don't even know what happened in those dungeons. All they know is some place where they see um, Americans in particular, but people from the diaspora, it could be the Caribbean as well, or UK. Uh, they just oh, see them in a place and it's an opportunity to sell them some things. So we're gonna teach them about this history. And also, um, just teach the young women or young girls, teenage girls, because we're targeting girls 13 to 18 years of age to become phenomenal women. You don't know what you don't know. So we're going to help with the prevention of premature pregnancies and just do what we can here in Mother Africa. 
I'm still working with my board in Baltimore. So we're gonna have a sister organization. So we'll bridge that gap. So the young women will co go to the US providing this COVID-19 um, fizzles out. And I'm telling you right now, I'm not taking a vaccine, but, and, and they can come, the sisters from the US, Baltimore can come here to Ghana. Um, the more we know about each other, the better this world would be. And this, this is why people like myself have heard the call to come to, back to Mother Africa to help build her. But for those of you who don't want to live here, please at least come here one time before you close your eyes for the last time to actually feel the energy because it's nothing like coming home. And that could be Ghana or any other place on the continent of Africa. But at least come one time and help support and let's build this. The bridges. Yeah. So we, need, we have work to do here as well as um, the U.S. and other parts of the diaspora. So I didn't, I wasn't timing myself, so I'm going to make sure I don't go over. Um, so, Haki, we're going to, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Najiri from Germany. And we're, this, is such, this is such a beautiful and powerful forum because here we have people of African descent from four different continents on this particular Zoom. Yes, I'm on the, um, uh, I'm, uh, uh, oh boy, I'm, I'm right in the what? middle of it. I sent, I sent out the link. Um, yeah, you sent out a link for what? Let me see, let me look at the chats. Okay. Um, the speaker, are we ready for um, Dr. Rehab Najiri? Are you are you ready from yes. Germany? Okay, I'm going to introduce you. Thank you. She is <laughs> she is a historian and passionate about African culture. She is a lecturer at University of Cologne and a board member of a, a, a board. I'm sorry, board member of the community activist group. Cologne for for Yundi, maybe you can for Yundi, which successfully voted the first black man just last September 2020 to the city of Cologne as the first black city council member. So she was a part of that. And what she's going to talk about today is the role of women in Mau Mau resistance. So Dr. Najeri, please. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I welcome everybody in my home in Cologne. Uh, so today I decided to talk about the Mau Mau women uh, because I just think they are an important part of uh, public service and what the Martin Luther King Day State that stands for. So um, once again, thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge that I'm not here alone, but I'm with those who have come before me and through their courage, uh, fearlessness, love, power, I am because they are. Um, with those whose names we know and those that we don't, uh, we still acknowledge them and remember them. Um, on this day, uh, I want to honor and acknowledge the great women of the civil rights movement and the black power movement, women such as uh, Coretta Scott King, Betty Shabazz, uh, who are committed um, to the serving or to serving their communities hand in hand with these great men um, I also acknowledge Winnie Mandela and Wangari Mathai for their service to the whole continent. Um, and I do also acknowledge my own mother uh, for her service and struggles to our own family. So um, Dr. King recognized the power of service and he once said that everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. And this was really made me think about uh, the Mau Mau women. So although it may seem as if there's no connection between what I would like to talk about today, 
But for me, these women were part uh, of the service to my country, Kenya, and also to my community. And so I do want to celebrate these women, uh, the women of Mau Mau, who, um, whom history has forgotten. Uh, and, uh, you know, their history or their struggle is always written out in the anti-colonial uh, war or rebellion of the Mau Mau. Um, these women provided a blueprint for African women, not only in Kenya, but across the continent. And today, from a global perspective, we place them on this global celebration. I understand, uh, I'll just put the, the short word, so LMD, as I did for us as children of Mother Africa to work together and to never forget the service that our people, especially Black women, did and continue to do up to this day. When we include, when we include Black women, like the Mau Mau women on this day, then the MLK Day or the Mal, uh, uh, Martin Luther King Day, uh, we empower ourselves, strengthen our communities, bridge, bridge uh, barriers, create solutions to social problems, and together we come closer to Dr. King's vision of a beloved community. Which then translates to the fact that um, the women of Mau Mau and their struggle and for our liberation was for our beloved country and for our communities. Um, as a historian, I find that there are parallel histories that were taking place both in Kenya and Black America. Dr. King played a role in the, um, uh, in the American civil rights and sought equality and human rights for African Americans, the economically disadvantaged and all victims of injustice through peaceful protest. At the same time, or at the same historical time, but on a different space, in Kenya, the Momo rebellion was rebelling against the British colonists who sought for rebellion for our motherland and our human rights. The case of Mau Mau anti-colonial struggles illustrates the neutrality between colonial hegemony and subaltern counter hegemony in which women were at the center of it. As we all know, or some might not know, the Mau Mau War was between 1952 to 1960, and it played a major role as a pan-Africanist liberation movement, which highly motivated, for instance, South African freedom icon Nelson Mandela who highlighted its pan-African role upon his release in 1990. And so in July, 1990, Mandela visited Kenya and openly recognized the role of Mau Mau women in his own inspiration as a freedom fighter. Accompanied by Winnie Mandela, he spoke about the women. Women played a critical role in this revolution because its ultimate triumph depended upon the success all successful appeals to women and families to supply resources to, to nourish it. The Mau Mau women were full of grace, as the quote I read before, were full of grace and souls generated by love for their people and country through their involvement in the liberation struggles of independence in Kenya. Um, a scholar, Tabitha uh, uh, Kononga, and whom I would like to acknowledge uh, one of the participants who is here, uh, Ms. Njeri Kamau, who you know, uh, introduced me to the other. Um, and she argues that um, the women of the Mau Mau were often strongholds in families. Initially, as men fled to the, uh, men fled to the forest, but women were not allowed. But in time, more and more women realized or became rebels and became invaluable allies to the men. To begin with, they began to allow single and widowed women who were trusted to remain secretive. In her analysis, some became free forest fighters and some were even, in the, uh, were even introduced into the inner secret council, which was formerly only for men. Can, uh, uh, Kanango has cited one woman and I will just mention a few of them. Uh, she has cited one woman called Wanjiro Nyamatura uh, who was known as a hardcore rebel. She was respected by all rebels, both men and women. She was in charge of distributing food and gathered intelligence. In her view, she changed the, perce the perception on how other rebels viewed women and eventually appreciated their role in the revolutionary mov uh, movement. Field Marshal Mudoni Karimi, who continued to wear Mau Mau dreadlocks, 
that she used to wear while in the forest 50, 50 years after Kenya's independence uh, was also one uh, woman who was strongly involved in the Mau Mau movement. Being the only woman to be accorded the title of a field marshal, Modoni must have been a tough fighter. Mm. There was also another Mau Mau leader woman, Wamboi Wakinyari, whose, level, whose rebel name was Matron. She came from um, a village uh, and uh, was in the Mau Mau administrative structure. She was in the Department of Medicine. So she was a nurse and uh, she attended to Mau Mau rebels and even to other women and other men once they came to the forest. Uh, there was also another fighter, Haraka. She was also one of, uh, of a general's bodyguard. She also served food to this bodyguard, but she was never allowed to carry a gun. But nevertheless, she was the bodyguard, so you couldn't get through her. With the rebel ranks like that of another woman called uh, Kohonokia, she was a very young woman. She was a rebel fighter like her male counterparts. There was also Jerena Wamoheni, also called Mudoniwa Kiando, who was also um, a very tough and powerful woman. Another woman who is really recognized as a, as a rebel was uh, Badi Wakamau, and she used to bring food to the Mau Mau soldiers while in the forest. In 1953, she played a key role in guiding the Mau Mau oath. She could also team up with others to lure mature girls um, to the oath in cer ceremony, which was mostly not accepted according to the Kikuyu tradition, but um, she nevertheless did it. So these women expressed their determination to remain in the forest, although life was very hard, because what they saw was is what they saw was better to die in the forest than be slaves in their own house. It is important that we keep the spirit and the struggle of these women alive and the next generation to make sure that history does not forget them. And so on this day, I would like to acknowledge the service of these women. I personally am following the path of these great women, also committed or committing myself into doing community work uh, and continuing to where these women left off or left. This is why I decided uh, to name some of these women or women fighters and position them back into our history and into our narratives. As a historian, I have dedicated myself into sharing my knowledge with my community here in Germany, in particular in Cologne, and transferring that knowledge for the visibility to our political power and education. As an active member of the International African School, we have taken upon ourselves to continue re-educating and shifting the negative uh, associations toward African languages by offering Swahili languages and African histories pre-slavery and colonization because we were the first people. It is important that we first deal with our own history and decolonize our minds in order to be able to progress here in Germany or even in Europe. We must unearth our histories and stories and position ourselves within this society that continues to write us out of history. Last year, as uh, the moderator introduced, I sat, uh, I ran for the city of the, uh, for a seat for the, in the city council as the only black woman, uh, but I did not get in, but we had one black man who got in and that is all we needed and wanted. So I'm very, still very happy and excited about that. So it's important for our African communities here in Germany to know that we can bring change when we work together and uplift each other. So political education and making sure that my community understands their right exercise their rights and fight for their rights is one way that I'm giving and trying to give back to my community. So I want to thank you all. I was told it's 10 minutes and I try to keep time. Thank you very much. Asante Nisana, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, I just have a quick question and we're gonna open up questions to the, the audience and, and feel free at the end of this, discussion today after you've heard from all the panelists um, put place your your questions in the chat box and then we will uh, answer your questions we'll address them to the panelists but I have a, a question I just since I've been here in Ghana I sat and talked with a sister from South Africa and she was talking about um, the violence the sexual violence that is a readily occurring thing in South Africa now 
And whereas here in Ghana, you know, men like you and all, but you don't, you don't have that fear. And she said she had an on, a true fear that in South Africa, but the women that you just described, I mean, they were badass. So what shifted? I think what happened is that, uh, you know, just like uh, in the civil rights movement or in the black power movement, women were not uh, uh, placed at the foreground, although, you know, without the women, they would not have been the revolution, right? And it's the same thing mm -hmm. happening in Kenya. These women were at the forefront, but you just write them out of history and then all the glory is given to the men. And, and so that's why I thought that today is, is, is just an important day to name these women and put them back uh, into history. And, uh, you know, giving them name also gives them life. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's uh, by naming and empowering them and also empowering ourselves, especially if you are the young generation um, of, of Africans uh, where we are saying Africa will rise and Africa can only rise if we also deal with our own history and acknowledge our own history and put it out in the front and say, yes, uh, there were men who were great men, but there were also a great and uh, uh, courageous women who did a lot for the, uh, for the struggle and anti-colonial um, uh, struggles in the continent. And I just think that they are left out. Um, it's the same thing with the climate change movement. Uh, you know, everybody's talking about the climate change movement, but nobody's talking about my, one of my role models, Wangari Madai. You know, she was talking about what is happening now already in the 70s. And so I just think that these women, especially African women coming from the African continent, just need to be, um, uh, you know, to be uh, put more in the open, to be mentioned often, um, so that they just become names that also our children know who these women are. And for me, learning about the Mau Mau women was just empowering because, and I can see her, Miss uh, Njeri Kamau, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm just trying to learn uh, the Kikuyu language. And, you know, she encouraged me by showing me some of the videos that I could actually listen to and learn my own, my, my own history. And, uh, you know, and talk about this history that most of us even who come from Kenya haven't really dealt with it. And so as a historian, I just think it's my responsibility to dig deeper and do research into that topic and, you know, put it out in the open so that, you know, we can learn and uh, educate each other. And as Gugi Wabiongo would say, decolonize our mind and our souls by learning our own history. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, doctor, I mean, it's, it's wonderful. We do need to get that out there because it's instead of it being his story, we need to learn the true story. So thank you so much. Our next speaker is Vamba Sharif. She's a novelist, uh, essayist, uh, es well, I'm butchering it, um, someone who writes essays, <laughs> teacher of creative, creative writing. And she was born in Liberia, but she currently lives in the Netherlands. And she's going to talk to us today about um, why don't we hear, I'm sorry, um, let me get this right, Sore Tore, Samore Tore and the African resistance to colonization. So this is a perfect segue to what um, Dr. Najiri just talked about, decolonizing the mind. So without further ado, um, Ms. Ba uh, Mr. Bamba. Bamba. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, Mr. I said, I said, I said, she. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much for the introduction, Andukwale, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jerry, for your celebration of the power of women in Africa in the African diaspora. Um, some years ago, I traveled through West Africa to research a novel about one of the greatest figures of African history, a man who fought for 20 years, fought the French, and for so many years also the English to try to free the decolonize his empire. During my research, I traveled through six, seven West African countries. Um, those countries included Liberia, where I was born, Sierra Leone, Guinea, Mali, Ivory Coast, um, Burkina Faso, Senegal, Benin, 
I traveled all through all these countries because the man I'm going to talk about, I'm going to, to, to share his story with you. His life touched all, all the people in all these countries in Proceed Africa. During my research in Senegal, I stumbled upon a fact, and that was that there was someone else. There was a writer and this African icon who was already trying to chronicle the life of this great African warrior and fighter. And the man who was in the Senegal was Simbin Usman. Most of you know that the father of the African cinema uh, was and is Simbin Usman. But what most people don't know was that for 40 years, Simbin Usman had been trying to make a film about this African resistant fighter and freedom fighter, Samori Touré. 40 years. Semen Usman, born in Senegal, very rebellious. There is a story about him fighting his French teacher, slapping his French teacher, because the French teacher had uh, denigrated his grandmother. And uh, so he, he was got angry and slapped his teacher, and he was expelled from school. So this Simbin Usman grew up with this sense of Africanness, pride of being an African. So he wanted to make this ultimate film about this African, ultimate African hero, Samori Touré. And for 40 years, he tried to make this film and he did not succeed. And why he did not succeed, it was because he did not, he did not have the finance he needed millions, he needed at least $50 million to make this epic film about Samori Touré. It did not work. So when I stumbled upon this fact that there was someone who was trying to do the same thing I've been trying to do, to write a novel, to write, to make a film about this great hero, I decided this was an extra incentive for me to, uh, to continue to write a novel that I could share with the world and with the African brothers and sisters all over the world. So I'm talking about 2003 when I made this journey through West Africa. And from, from that day up, up to this day, I've been writing this novel and the novel is finished now. Um, the novel is with my agent in the US and hopefully sometime next year or this year, uh, a good publisher will love it and um, decide to publish it. Um, who was Samori Touré? Samori Touré was born in present day Guinea in a very small village of no consequence, a small place. I don't think with, I think many like 50 or 100 people. What was unique about this man? He was born into a family of weavers, which was very in the Mandi culture, the Madingo culture. Weavers were not that important. It was a caste culture. It's like in India, um, which I don't um, condone, but that's my heritage. So you had this caste system in the Monday culture and somebody belonged to the to a family or clan of weavers, but he took up trade. So he was trading with Liberia, with the Liberians because Liberia had been founded by African-Americans who had returned uh, back to Africa after centuries of bondage. And um, so somebody was doing trading with Liberians on the coast and with the English in Freetown. So one day uh, in his absence, his mother was captured by a ruler and, and enslaved. So somebody returned from the journey and he was told that his mother had been captured. So somebody decided to go and confront this king. So when he came to the king, he asked, he told the king, I'm the, I'm the son of this mother, of this woman, Masarona. And I came to buy her freedom. So the king asked him, by what means do you want to do that? So somebody said, I want to be your slave in her stead so that she can gain her freedom. And the king agreed. 
So Samuel became a slave for this king who, whose name was Serebama. What happened, as it usually happened in history, this king was so um, enamored with Samuel, so admired his talent that he, uh, he drew him closer to him and taught him everything. So Samuel grew up to become a great, to become a great fighter uh, and one of the advisors of this man. And he became also powerful. In the end, he rose up against his king and he conquered him. So that's just an aspect of the story of this great man that I wrote about in this epic novel. It's, it's six, 700 pages long. Um, I spent more than 10 years writing it. So what I'm going to do is I, I will tell you, i read an excerpt from the novel, which is very exclusive. I mean, you are the first, I mean, hearing this um, because it's yet to be published. So I'm reading uh, the first time uh, we meet, we get to meet the reader, meet somebody in my novel. The novels, the title of the novel will be The Empire's Song. The first thing Zywolo, the main character of the novel, noticed about Samori when he met him was his gaze. It was hard and piercing, a look capable of paralyzing an adversary. They lingered about him an intimidating silence, which as with everything that had formed him, had been cultivated during his days as a slave. The trader turned slave, then warrior, and now king, had learned the silence bred mystery. And it was to this mystery and nothing else that he owed his existence. The dark and glossy skin of his face gleamed in the flickering light of his sofa's torches. His jaw was slender, his chin sharp, and his wrist were marked by vitiligo. Between his brows and around his nose ran two furrows, which gave his face an extraordinary intensity rarely found in other men. Outside Misaidu's walls, far from the eyes of the sentinels, Samori sat cross-legged on the grass. His posture clearly showed that he had come to issue orders and expected to be obeyed by the letter. A sword rested on his lap. His back was as straight as a pole. It was believed that he decapitated his enemies with that sword. Beside him lay his javelin, which served as a weapon and staff, for his hands were often restless if there was nothing to hold on to. And further on, another excerpt. Samori mountain mounted his horse, Kausu, which had been with him for years. Since the onset of his conquering streak in Lower Conier, Samori had developed the habit of pausing outside the gates of each conquered city or town, as if to appraise it. He gazed at Misado now, which appeared, which appeared dormant in the distance. Although the city was not yet part of his possessions, he had his greatest scholar as an ally. Mesadu was also coveted by men like Sai of the Banguna Mountain, another ruler who was about his age. For his greatest adversary in Konya was and remained Sarah Brahma, the man who captured his mother and enslaved him. Samori vowed to conquer Mesadu, not only because of his strategic location as a trading post that connected the savannah to the forest and the coast of Liberia, but also because of his past. Misadu was a mother of all towns and villages in Konya, a place from where people had migrated to populate the savannah. Part of him were connected to Misadu in the person of his mother, whose past was rooted in the forest. The rest of him was steeped in the old empire belonging to Sundieta Keita, the man whose fame had reached the four corners of the earth. 
every time he thought of his origins and he it's, often did so in those hello, Vamba. empire building yeah Somebody, Vamba, can you, yes can you um in the essence is beautiful but as it's a time i'm going to have to cut you short right, thank you yes. um and plus i wanted to ask you a question before yeah. we get to our next speaker but um in the chat box, someone wrote that you have written, written many books. And at the beginning of your talk, um, you said that you're going to publish this one in the United States. Did yes. I hear that correctly? Yes. Are they are they published on the continent as well? Do you have, um, are your books on no, the continent? My, my books are in English and other languages. They are not in African languages, no. Because I'm based, I came here, I came to the Netherlands as a refugee. Um, I went to school here, read law, and my books, my first book is actually about the founding of Liberia with the return of African Americans to, to Africa in the, in the 19th century. That book is in English, and it's also available in Liberia, yes, it can be found in Liberia, in the, in the U.S. or through Amazon, yes. Uh, but what about the countries on the continent that speak English? I mean, what are your goals as far as having them distributed there because they do need to know what well, we need to know this history or these histories. Yeah. Yes, I've been, I, a friend of mine, Wyatt Moore, who is also a writer based in New York, we have a bookstore in, in Monrovia, Liberia. And, um, and um, so we're trying to distribute the books in Liberia. And also um, hopefully when the book is, is published in the US, I would like to work together with um, um, with uh, Bibi Bakari Yusuf of Cassava Republic as a publisher based in Nigeria to try to make these books available for, 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 for my brothers and sisters in Africa. So that's my hope. And, um, uh, and I'm involved with organizations not only uh, in the diaspora, but also in Africa. I've attended festivals. I've been to South Africa, I've been to Nigeria. Uh, to other places on the continent to celebrate and to share our stories. And Samori is just one of many stories. Samori was actually um, uh, greater than Shaka Zulu, who is so very famous in the West, but um, achievements wise, Samori was much, wow. much greater than Shaka Zulu. And uh, so his story is very relevant. Wow. Uh, because according, according to Simbin Usman, Sam, mm -hmm. Samori came four great rulers, uh, Napoleon, the, Napoleon, Charles the Great, um, Attila the Horn, and Peter the Great. So if one leader could encapsulate four great ru rulers of the West, you can just imagine who this person must have been, how, how remarkable he must have been. And so um, this is my most ambitious novel. And I felt that because we're celebrating a great man today that I should share uh, people, the story of someone who came before him and who might have inspired him directly or indirectly. Samari was absolutely uh, a source of inspiration for many African freedom fighters uh, in Africa and in diaspora. That's wonderful. Since you mentioned Shaka Zulu, uh, the reason why we all know about Shaka Zulu is because of that iconic um, movie or miniseries that was done on him in the yes. 1980s. So something similar need to, needs to be done on Tore as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. yes. I'm going to make it my goal, my, li my uh, lifelong goal to make a movie about somebody. It has to be done because he was such yes. a remarkable person, human being, yes. Well, thank you so much for sharing that very, very great history. I know I learned something and um, we'll ask more questions at the Yes. I think we have Mr. Swain in the house. Pardon me? We have Mr. Swain in the house. Yes, so... I'm getting ready to introduce him. <laughs> so, Mr. John Swain of the Civil Rights Center, uh, we ask for you to speak now and share with us uh, what you're doing. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to join you all and talk about the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Here at the International Civil Rights Center and Museum, 
uh, we focus on nonviolence as well. As you all may be fully aware, uh, the International Civil Rights Center and Museum came into being um, on February 1 of 2010 when we opened our doors to the public and um, launched uh, this powerful uh, educational attraction. And so many people who think of in terms of the civil rights struggle, think of the violent pieces of it. And the four young men who sat down at the FW White's only lunch counter, FW Woolworth's White's only lunch counter on February 1 of 1960, did so with the full knowledge that they had one thing that Dr. King used to talk about. And that is cashing the promissory note. Dr. King understood that in 1868, the US government promulgated the 14th Amendment to ratified and promulgated the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution, which guaranteed all citizens who are born or naturalized here in the United States full and equal protection under the law. Now, you may recall that after, uh, here in the US, after Reconstruction, uh, when the slaves were free in the South, the Ku Klux Klan and Jim Crow, Jim Crow advocates went to work to suppress the full impact of what it meant to be a citizen. And when Dr. King says to the nation, we are here, to cash a promissory check, a check that is long overdue. He was talking about the full impact and the full reach of the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution. African-Americans would wait nearly 90 years before they were granted that protection under the law. When African-American students from North Carolina A&T, uh, David Richmond, Frank McCain, Ezell Blair and Dr. Joseph McNeil, when they came to this very location uh, 61 years ago, this next month, uh, February 1, when they came here, it's because they understood the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, that we should be treated with basic dignity and respect. These young men, the AT4 that we call them, they had studied our US Constitution and they knew it inside and out. And they knew that if they came to the FW Woolworths here in Greensboro, North Carolina, they sat down uh, like respectful citizens in society and order a simple cup of coffee, they should have been served at the whites only lunch counter. They were denied that service for the full day. And as Dr. King preached nonviolent, uh, this was something that he had also uh, learned from Gandhi, uh, nonviolent disobedience. Do what you are supposed to do and in a non-threatening way and let the perpetrators who are advancing uh, Jim Crow regimes be seen as the real fools in society. So. Those young men simply sat down at the counter and requested service here at Woolworths. And they were denied and they continued to sit quietly waiting to be served a cup of coffee. By the end of the day when the store had closed, they still had not been served. But they returned the next day and the next day and the next day Nonviolently, there were threats against their lives, but they continued to return until July 25th of 1960, when the F.W. Woolworth lunch counter was finally desegregated. So part of the legacy of Dr. King in helping American citizens to stay alive is know your rights, advance those rights, teach those rights. And one of my best friends um, 
who recently passed away. She was the um, she was the curator for this museum and the former director of the museum. She would often say to me when I came to work for this institution, if there are things that you do not know, learn them. If there are things that you have mastered, teach them. My background is as a CPA, Certified Public Accountant, and I'm the head of the International Civil Rights Center and Museum. Uh, I've run this institution since 2014 as the CEO of the place and continued in my role of Director of Finance or CFO uh, of the institution. But what I've come to realize is that all of my educational upbringing has prepared me for a moment such as this. I was only a young kid when I would see Dr. King on television. Um, I actually integrated my first grade class. Uh, when I would look around my classrooms, there were only maybe two or three African-American students in a classroom of about 30. So growing up, that was my surrounding. And I, I came to know these students that I was surrounded by as just friends, colleagues, classmates. Race did not come into the picture. Race did not come into the picture because we were integrating um, and doing something very powerful, taking a group of young kids in a non-threatening way and advancing uh, this notion that we can live together in society and go about our normal lives and, and not have such distinction. Um, what I have learned uh, looking back and connecting with some of the people that I grew up with, they grew into their racism. And that is the unfortunate piece. They have grown into their racism while I have continued to look back to my upbringing and move into the future. As Dr. King says, at a time where blacks and whites can walk hand in hand. So at this museum of civil rights reflection, we educate the world. We have uh, groups from all over the globe that travel to here to learn about civil and human rights. Uh, and that's what we are most known for, uh, nonviolent civil disobedience. And I think for people who care about uh, justice, who care about freedom, who care about equality, core democratic values, they would look to Dr. King and say, a leader who was before his time, way before his time. But I can only imagine what our world would be like if Dr. King were still alive today. Now, I'm not a bloviator. Um, I like to engage with people. So if there are some particular questions that uh, you all have, I'm quite interested in uh, learning from you as well, because this is my first opportunity to engage with such a wonderful audience. Well, we'll we're holding our questions to the end okay. um, from, the, from the participants. So please stay on. And I, I had the fortune of visiting your museum in 2019, I came with the National Association of Black Storytellers and oh, your exhibit. Yes. yes. And I, and I, I remember know. seeing you. I remember. I asked you all to yeah. write a, a, a narrative for the museum. Yes. <laughs> I remember. And talk about, talk about storytellers. I mean, you're, you're a docent. I mean, well, your tour guides, and I don't even want to call them a tour guide because that's, that's really understating. I mean, just, just phenomenal. And your exhibits are phenomenal. So hopefully once this COVID-19 lifts, people will actually be able to go to the museum. It's not the same as going virtually. I know it's not. I mean, I just love your museum. I really well, do. Well, we have, during the COVID shutdown, what we've done was taken the opportunity to grow the museum. 
one of the things mm -hmm. that I've been wanting to do is reach across the globe even further because I've had lots of teachers like yourself who would come here and when they would finish our tour, finish the tour, they would say, wow, I'd love to bring all my kids here. I'd love to bring all my kids here, but it's not possible. Uh, so what we've done during the shutdown was I brought my staff back together and I said, now is an opportunity for us to take the museum to the world. Uh, we've recorded the virtual tours. So I've recorded and uploaded seven of my um, senior interpreters. Uh, we've got a few more that I'm going to uh, advance, but now is an, a great opportunity for people all over the world to even just log on and take the uh, self-guided uh, film tour and our engaging uh, interactive tours, um, they're quite powerful. We have about 300 people on uh, an interactive tour today. Uh, so they're, they're, they're moving quite along. But um, I, I, all of that to say, uh, we, we are an educational resource and many young African-American children that have visited this museum would walk away and say, oh, I didn't know that white people were involved in the civil rights movement. And one was quoted in a magazine and saying, I'm gonna to have to go back to school and rethink what I think about white people. I didn't know this. So this is a powerful institution that teaches these lessons, no matter how you slice it and dice it. Uh, there are great lessons to be learned. Um, Dr. King's influence in the church. Uh, we all know that at the end of his life, most of the church was pulling away from him. They had seen folks being lynched and, and their homes burn out, all of that. But Dr. King continued to say, let's stay the course. Let's stay the course. And when we had the 1963 March on Washington, it was an opportunity for the whole nation to see the power of African Americans and what can be done. The Montgomery bus boycotts was another opportunity. He was involved in so much and his work, his interactions kept a lot of people alive because we could have easily taken up arms and said, okay, we're gonna fight, uh, but we've never had the most powerful weapons to fight back with. So the legacy of Dr. King will live forever for those who are just willing to be part of that nonviolent uh, movement. And I wanna speak to just very, very briefly to that uh, nonviolent um, cause I, when I went to the museum that I did not know that they weren't the first people who sat at the counter weren't the ones where the co hot coffee was being poured on and it actually went very, very peacefully. I was, I was shocked, but the images we do see are the ones that are being accosted, but I want to speak to the strength of those brothers and sisters who endured that because that took way more strength than I know I had because I would have come up swinging. So that took a lot more courage to do that. That is true. And we've heard that quite a bit. One of the exhibits that we're getting ready to launch from here is called Sit In Nation. Uh, it's an exhibit that's been underwritten by the Fresh Market uh, food chain here in Greensboro. But we're going to talk about uh, the fact that Greensboro was not the first sit in movement. It was not the first one that occurred. People lost their lives just for going to a whites only lunch counter and sitting down. Uh, they had hot coffee poured on them. They had cigarette butts put out in their hair. They had eggs and sugar poured all over their bodies. A lot of that you're gonna see in the deeper South in Georgia and Alabama, over in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, that's where a lot of that that terrible violence took place. But for Greensburg, Greensburg has always fashioned itself as a progressive city. And I say to that, uh, there's a problem there if you're not following the law and advancing people's equal rights under the constitution. 
I don't know how you can really call yourself a nonviolent uh, progressive city. But here in Greensboro also, we are surrounded by a large number of Jewish people and a large number of Quakers. And if you know anything about the Quaker faith and religion, they are by nature a nonviolent people. Now, they will fight for your rights to be free. Okay. But that's not necessarily to say that they want you in the church with them. They want you sitting at their table. But they believe oh. in, in freedom. Now, um, we, we're going to continue this conversation when we open it up. But we thank you so much for being with us. And we're going to move on to our next speaker in the interest sure. of time. But we're going to change the format just a little bit. So, Sister Kim, can you hear me? Would you like to introduce Wale Mo? Brother Am Amsada, Kim, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I was. I wanted Kim to introduce you, give you a rightful introduction. I know I went on your on your uh, website and gosh, I mean, you have done so much. I'll be here all day trying to talk about it, but if Kim's not Kim's not available, I can do my best if you just give me the liberty. So um, this brother that's getting ready to speak, he is from born and raised in Harlem, USA. And he is the poster child, if you will, of um, civil rights, those iconic uh, images that we, we see. And he was just born into the Mecca of civil rights. Um, in his bio, he talks about how he actually was right, he grew up in the projects that right by the harbor, if you correct me if I'm wrong, that the Honorable Marcus Garvey had his ships in. So, I mean, when I just read that, that was powerful. Um, but um, you've done so much, a director of the political affairs for the Congress of Racial Equity, this is 1972. Um, so it is still in the heart of the civil rights movement. Uh, you went to Syracuse University uh, where you founded a student group. And let me see if I can get that. Um, what is the name of the student group that you founded? A, a student African-American Society. <clears throat> yes. And you've been to the continent. You um, helped with the African Liberation Day forming that and fought against apartheid. It just goes on and on and on. So without further ado, I would like to introduce, and I hope I'm not butchering your name, Wali Mo Amsada, okay. AKA Brown. So you can um, so tell us the proper pronunciation of your name. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, my dear sister. And thank you for everybody who's already spoken here and thank you for the invitation. Um, to speak. Um, Sister Kim had asked me to give a, a, a keynote address, so I'm going to try to do that. Um, <clears throat> appropriate pronunciation of my name would be Malimo uh, Amsada. <clears throat> well, it is uh, Malimo Kwasi Kwaja Amsada, but I was born Edward H. Brown Jr. Uh, so people who commonly call me uh, Brother Amsada, that's the name I was given in Senegal uh, in 1995. Um, <clears throat> I want to go right into the remarks that I had made again. Um, <clears throat> again, my name is Malimo Kwasi Kwaja. I'm Sada. I'm the coordinator for the Pan-African Federalist Movement in North America. And I'm also the author of uh, The New Pan-Africanism 2020, which is a book that uh, was published uh, earlier in this decade. Uh, but enough about me. Let's talk about the man of the hour, who is Martin Luther King. <clears throat> Last Friday, January 15th, 2021, marked the 92nd anniversary of the birth of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He was born on January 15th, 1929, and he transitioned on April 4th, 1968. I remember being on work study duty in Kimball Dormitory as a junior in a 20 year old student activist at Syracuse University on April 4th, when I first learned that Dr. King had just been assassinated. Dr. King was 39 at the time of his death. 
the relative young ages of Dr. King in 1968 and myself, 39 and 20 respectively, speaks to the central and critical role of young people in the struggle for the liberation and political unification of African people. Along the same vein, it's worthy to note that Marcus Garvey was only 32 when his organization convened the first convention of African peoples of the world 100 years ago. This gathering assembled 25,000 black people from 40 different countries for the entire month of August. And that's where we got the colors red, black, and green. And again, Garvey was only 32 at the time of this historical and consequential African Global Convention in August 1920. And King was only 34 in August of 1963 when he gave his most famous speech at the historic March on Washington. But from the very beginning, Dr. King saw his role as a drum major in the universal struggle for African freedom for all African, all people of African ancestry. Just three months after King had won his first victory in the year-long Montgomery boycott in December of 1956, he found himself in West Africa at the independence celebration of Ghana on March 6, 1957. And while there, he met Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who became Ghana's first prime minister in 1957, his first president in 1960, and the most consequential Pan-African in, in the second half of the 20th century. <clears throat> And as Dr. King observed the old Union Jack flag of England coming down and the beautiful multicolored flag of Ghana going up, he turned to Congressman Adam Clayton Powell from Harlem on his right and Dr. Ralph Bunch, the first Black Nobel Peace Prize on his left. And he said, that old flag coming down represents an old order passing away. And that new flag represents a new order coming in. Dr. King was very moved by his experience in Ghana and spoke of it often, most notably at his own Abyssinia Baptist Church immediately upon his return in a sermon entitled Birth of a Nation. And later in a, in a, <coughs> later in a wider speech to a wider audience remaining awake to a great revolution. Dr. King always put Ghana's independence in Africa in the context of the freedom struggle of black people in America. He saw a strong connectivity between the Black freedom struggles of African people on both sides of the Atlantic. In the essay entitled, The Time for Freedom Has Come, which was written in the New York Times Magazine on September 29, 1961, Dr. King noted, and I quote, many students, <coughs> many students when pressed to express their inner feelings, identify themselves with the students of Africa. The liberation struggles in Africa have been, a great, have been the greatest single influence of African-American students. Frequently, I hear them say that if our brothers and sisters in Africa can break the bonds of colonialism, surely black people in America can break Jim Crow. African leaders such as Nkrumah from Ghana, Inekwe from uh, Nigeria, Tom Maboya from Kenya are po popular heroes on the black college campuses. Many groups demonstrated and protested when the Congo leader Patrice Lumumba was assassinated. Part of the impatience of Black youth stems from the observations that change is taking place rapidly in Africa and other parts of the world, but comparatively slow in the South. Uh, that's the end of the quote. <coughs> in the New World Order <coughs> that Dr. King spoke of, on March 6, 1957 in Ghana, reached its zenith 37 years later with the swearing in of Nelson Mandela as the first president of South Africa on May 11, 1994. Dr. King paid his respects to another Pan-African freedom fighter, the aforementioned Marcus Garvey, on a trip to Jamaica with his wife on June 20, 1965. While there, he laid a wreath at the shrine of where Marcus Garvey's body had been re-entombed. In so doing, Dr. Gar Dr. King said, and I quote, Marcus Garvey was the first man of color in the history of the United States to lead and develop a mass movement. He was the first man on a mass scale and level to give millions of black people a sense of dignity, destiny, and somebodiness. I believe if Dr. King had survived his assassination in 1968, he would probably have spent some time in apartheid South Africa in the 1970s and 80s, working with Bishop Tutu 
the African National Congress, the Pan-African Congress, and other indigenous groups and movements in the struggle to free Nelson Mandela and secure the freedom and democracy for the Black people in South Africa through nonviolence. Through these efforts, we may very well have seen Nelson Mandela freed and elected the first president of South Africa a decade earlier in the 1980s. It's ironic <clears throat> that in the first year that the third Monday in January was designated as an annual federal holiday in King's Honor, January 20th, 1986, was the same year that a mass movement of black people in the streets of America led to the United States Senate overriding President Reagan's veto of sanctions against South Africa on October 2nd, 1986. This was done by a vote of 78 to 21, which was 11 votes more than the two thirds required to override a presidential veto. But that's how we roll. Contrast our effective and dignified exercise of what Dr. King would say is the right to protest for right with the unruly, unpatriotic, and insurrectionist actions of the white supremacists in Washington, D.C. two weeks ago. But let's not get distracted. <clears throat> On that historical day in Washington, D.C., August 28, 1963, when Martin Luther King ended his visionary speech by saying that will be the day when we will be able to say in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, great God Almighty, we are free at last. Perhaps Dr. King was looking forward to the historical day exactly 45 years in the future on August 28, 2008 in Denver, Colorado, when a black man fist bumped his wife who was direct descendants of enslaved Africans and then went before a record breaking crowd of 84,000 people to become the first person of African ancestry to accept the nomination of his party for president of the United States. Or perhaps in that final speech, when he said, I may not get there with you, but I know as a people, we will get to the promised land. He was envisioning that auspicious occasion 48 hours from now, when a, when a black woman who like himself graduated from an historically black university will raise her hand and take the oath of vice president of the United States, becoming the first woman in American history to do so. But I believe that Dr. King envisioned something much bigger than either of these two epic events. When he said in that faithful and final speech, one day before his passing, God has allowed me to go up to the mountaintop and I has looked over and I've seen the promised land. I believe at that moment, Dr. King became conscious of the mission of the Pan-African Federalist Movement to bring the United African States into political existence. 47 years before the movement itself came into being in 2015. I believe that Dr. King knew that the birth of the United States of Africa was single the reemergence of Africa as a world power that would be the master of its own destiny, able to manage the vast resources of Africa for the benefit of African people worldwide and fully capable of dealing with all of the global powers that be from a position of strength. Accordingly, I believe that the promised land of freedom that Martin Luther King saw <clears throat> was a day in this decade, a few years from now, when, a <clears throat> when the black United States Senator from Georgia, who is pastor of, Ebene of Dr. King's own Ebenezer Baptist Church, will stand with all of us to bear witness to the first president of the United States of Africa, raise her hand to take the oath of office. On that note, I'd end with the words of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who so profoundly influenced the young 28-year-old Dr. King during his visit to Ghana in 1957. Africa must unite, now, period. And yes, there may be some difficult days ahead, but make no mistake about it, we shall overcome. Welcome to the celebration of the International MLK Day of Service, Asante Sana, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brother Amasada. Amasada. Um, that was wonderful, and you gave us some insight on Dr. King that we, I'm sure a lot of us did not know. I would like to now introduce, reintroduce uh, the wonderful vocalist we heard at the top of our program, Lee Smith. Uh, she's a stage artist, producer, musicologist, and is active in the art and culture sector. 
She is curious and deepens herself in philosophy, spiritual, spirituality, and development. Elizabeth lives in Suriname. Suriname. So without further ado, Elizabeth, we're going to talk Thank about you your service and struggle of independence in your home, Thank Suriname. You. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Delia, for inviting me in this uh, wonderful program. Dear friends, brothers and sisters, wherever you are, hello. A respectful, silent greeting and very special thanks to our illuminators, our heroes, our ancestors until the seventh generation. We are grateful that we can receive so much knowledge, love, insight, inspiration, spiritual and material wealth to rise, rise and shine, but also to help others. To A special thanks to the workers of the Supreme Being, the Most High on our path that have truly inspired us and, and particularly continue to impart us the knowledge. Uh oh, do we have some technical difficulties? For the protection of the strength of the sound and shaking. Thank you. Can you hear us? Are you still with us? I am. Elizabeth? For who I am. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, the goodwill factor. We can't hear her or see her. Um, did she drop? We'll take a look. I can see her, but she's frozen. Oh. Ms. Elizabeth, um, your connection is bad. I can, I know over here, I can barely hear you. How about everybody else? Oh, someone said try turn off your video because that does take up less bandwidth. I have to turn off my video. We can see you. Your video's on. Now we can. I should turn. I can. I should turn, turn off your off. video and just do audio. Yes. Let's try that. Yes. Okay. Should I can continue? Yes, continue. Okay. Please. The goodwill factor. You know, community service is- Can everybody hear her? Yes, we can hear her. They're saying, they're saying um, they can hear you. It sounds better. Just proceed, please. Okay. We're in the energy of life giving and taking is balanced out. We will take a look at the even and odd balance, the pro and cons between the giver and the recipient and the goodwill factor. What of the one who elevates you spiritually and materially. What is the blueprint of the giver? What is the plan? What is the plan? What is the blueprint of the recipient? What should the result be? Let us observe the giver. Um, excuse me. Let's observe the giver. Yes. D 
dear brothers and sisters, let's observe the giver. In the first place, nature, the wind, the sun, the moon, the water, the trees, and animals. The second place, the human being, the elderly, men and women, the young, children. This group saying, there's a group saying, because we are taught to give. For example, many say, many seeing exist. Who give will also receive. Who does good, who meets good. Or do good and don't look back. You must give. Otherwise you have no room to receive. Sometimes we think that we haven't, that we have given a lot. But what is the meaning of giving? What is our fundamental thought of giving? What is the energy we vibrate? Are you granted someone based on pure love, respect, honesty, and prosperity? Let us observe the recipient. Sometimes solicited or unsolicited, something is given to you, a gift, a box with secondhand articles, a container with discarded items, but also a scholarship, an education, knowledge, money, a meal, a book, a compliment, but also a form of belief. Sometimes you receive so much, but at the same time, structurally a lot is taken from you. What is the purpose? What is the energy? What is the vibration? What is the fundamental thought of the recipient? Who makes a sacrifice? Who feels the sacrifice? Who is the victim? Some people must learn to give. Men, women, children, we all must learn to give, but also learn to receive what to receive and how to receive. We must know that spiritual and material wealth is our for the taking. Also, we must know that we are not victims or that we can't be into victims again. Sometimes, or perhaps very often, this energy threatens to take over as part of the plan. Giving, service, why do we give? Do you give to repeat every day after today that you have given and what you have given? Do you give to exercise power over the one you gave? That one that gives determines. Shouldn't the recipient sometimes be more careful about what they receive? Do you always have to accept what is given or offered to you? Do you give so that other person can rise, rise and shine? What is the blueprint in life? In my native language, Saranatongo, they would say, stay woke, which applies to both the giver and the recipient. Because the goodwill factor differs from person to person, nearby, far away, family, social context, the community in which we live, but especially with political leaders close by and world leaders who do not know the goodwill factor as an essential human component even though they preach and teach it. Giving and receiving can be destructive and even promote spiritual poverty, but it can certainly be enriching and prosperous. Life is giving and taking, even though some people think it's only giving and some, some people think it's only receiving. But the goodwill factor is an important aspect in giving and receiving. How strong is the goodwill factor in you? How strong is the goodwill factor in me? It is, is it 
sincerely granted to you? Can you honestly say to yourself, it has been granted to me? Balance or no balance, everything has an effect on the human being. But we are capable of giving the best and receiving the best. On this special day, we must once again remind and inspire each other for the umpteen time. But we must continue to do it, to learn from our predecessors who carried a high degree of goodwill factor within them and what it means to us. What has worked and what wasn't, what hasn't worked and what still doesn't work. We have to be patient with each other, forgiving due to ignorance and especially in that eye. Stay woke. Let us carry on with the good intention of sharing because giving and receiving is sharing. Let us continue, but let our blueprint print be based on the pureness of the goodwill factor to rise, rise and shine, inspired by the spiritual source of our Supreme Being, the Most High. Our brother, the Honorable Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had a great suggestion of how to design our life's blueprint. This is the most important and crucial period of your lives for what you do now and what you decide now at this age may well determine which way your life shall go. And the question is whether you have a proper, a solid, and a sound blueprint. And I want to suggest some of the things that should be in your life's blueprint. Number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your own worth, and your own somebodyness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you are nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth. And I always feel that your life has ultimate significance. Secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have, as the basic principle, the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. You're going to be deciding as the days and the years unfold what you will do in life, what your life's work will be. Once you discover what it will be set out to do it and to do it well. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. Or it isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. And finally, in your life's blueprint, must be a commitment to the eternal principles of beauty, love, and justice. Well, life for none of us has been a crystal star, but we must keep moving. We must keep going. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl, but by all means, keep moving. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And actually, I'm misspoke far as your title, pros and cons of a giver and a receiver. And thank you so much. And it's someone told me a long time ago that a closed hand can't receive. So if you're trying to hold on something so tightly, you're not able to receive what's out there for you. So thank you so much. And our last panelist today is, hails right here from Ghana. And his, his name is Amu, Bas Baskow. Um, I hope I'm not butchering once again. Um, the organization is Musician Union of Ghana and it was established in 1975 and it currently has 4,500 members but it represents 30 musicians. And the, the mission statement 
is promoting and preserving Ghanaian culture through educating and equipping the Ghanaian musician to be self-reliant, creative, and industrious. So without any further ado, Oma. <clears throat> Are you there? Hello. Oma, Pascal, can you hear us? I hope it's not that Ghanaian internet acting up. Aki, are you there? Yes, I'm here, sister. Uh, what's going on? I, I think the gentleman is oh, still yeah. on. Um, so yeah, maybe I see him, but... having some chat. Okay. Um, perhaps yeah. is he unmuted? Lower left hand corner, unmute, Baba. He may be reconnecting. Okay. Oh, he's reconnecting. Possibly. Let's see. Okay. So um, well, in the meantime, while he's reconnected, um, if, we can, if we have any questions for the panelists, can we open those up and people place in the chat, um, chat box any questions you may want to ask any of our esteemed panelists today? <laughs> questions or comments? Um, You've been making wonderful comments as they were speaking. Any questions at all? I'm going to ask one. I'm going to ask one uh, on the question. I'm okay. trying to take it. <laughs> Hold on. OK. Who's speaking? Questions are in the chat box. Ono Kweli, um, so we do have a question. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think, let me see if it's in there. I don't see it. Um, I thought I saw a question. Please share it. Well, I, I believe there was a question about how do we move from civil rights to human rights? Uh, anyone can take that question if anyone cares to elaborate on that. Um, brother, or Sada? is there a difference? Or is there a difference? Uh, <clears throat> it is a difference. Uh, Malcolm X talked about human rights. Uh, that it's a human rights struggle because human rights. Uh, if you don't have human rights, you don't have civil rights. Civil rights is both basically um, your rights within the Constitution of the United States. Human rights are your, are your global rights. The right, your rights as being a human being, as Malcolm X would say. So um, that's the distinction. Um, <clears throat> I think that at this point, we need to be thinking about our, our African humanity from a global scale and what rights we have as an African people. There are 1.3 billion Africans on the continent. And our primary struggle now is to regain our sovereignty. We have, in the, we have 55 independent states, but their sovereignty is being compromised by the Chinese. Mm. Okay. Is it just me or did he freeze? No. Yeah, he froze. He froze. Okay. Chinese by okay. Oh, okay, you okay. froze, Brother Sada. Okay. I don't know at which point I froze. I didn't realize I had. Uh, I think you were saying something about the Chinese, maybe. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I'm I was saying, okay, I, I explained the difference between human rights and um, civil rights. 
uh, and I use Malcolm X, uh, Omawali Malcolm X, son who's, son who's come home. That's the name he was given when he went to Nigeria. I like to use Omawali Malcolm X. Oh, it keeps freezing. All right. Malcolm X. Omawali Malcolm Oh, I don't know what's happening. Uh, yeah, you keep freezing. and you, I'm doing better than you, and I'm in Ghana, and you in, you in the U.S. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, freezing up on us. Because I don't see, I see myself constantly talking, so I'm not aware. Yeah. Can you see me now? Yeah. No, you're good now. Come on. Yes. If you want to. All right. Well, let me let me see if I can just be brief. The, the question was the difference between human rights and, and, and uh, civil rights. And I said that civil rights is a domestic concern within the American Constitution of the United States, our rights underneath the Constitution, whereas human rights is your rights, as, as Malcolm would say, as a being. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Your rights as a human being. Uh, human rights are, are larger than um, are the rights you were born with, and they're global. And then I talked a little bit about African humanity, the, the 1.3 billion Africans throughout the world, and our rights, uh, and, and being able to protect our rights and our own sovereignty, which is um, the primary struggle for African people at this point, uh, which is to uh, begin to create a political entity that, which can represent the 1.3 and 1. billion African people throughout the world so that we could address the, the powers that be, whether they be China, Europe, uh, United States even, from a position of strength. And that we, that, that's the, the guarantee of, of, that we would be able to protect the, the, the human rights of African people throughout the world. So I guess I maybe elaborated a little bit on your question, but I hope I gave you an, a direct answer. Okay, thank you so much. It looks like we may have Ayuma back on. Are you there, Ayuma Bosco? I see him on the screen, his picture, but he may not be there. Okay. He's muted. All right. All right, Haki. Um, should we wrap things up now? I Here guess we, we can. Uh, everything, everyone has gone, right? So uh, uh, thank yes. you, uh, everybody, for on behalf of the Teaching Artists Institute. Let me just kind of put my Happy. face here. Happy. Yes. Um, uh, Njia was to present what he's doing okay. um, in Kenya for the human rights. Okay. Yes. Oh, OK. Oh, good. Great, great, great. Yes, Go for it then very quickly. Okay. G here. Good afternoon. Am I? I guess it doesn't come natural. Like just. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, um, my name is Njihia. And I think, uh, let me just uh, start by uh, saying thank you so much for the several presentations which have been done. Uh, I'm struggling a bit uh, on my echo. I think I'm using my laptop and uh, my phone. My phone for the image and my um, laptop for the, basically for just following up on the chats. And so um, let me just uh, say by, start by saying my name is Mjehe, I'm from Kenya. I'm an entrepreneur, a social entrepreneur for that matter. I, I, by training, I'm a marketer and I've cut across several industries. I've worked in the, hello, you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, so um, by training, I was a marketer and uh, by professionally, I've worked across the industries in the IT um, for three years, brewing for 10 years, banking for th three years, and now construction for about 10 years. So essentially, as a social entrepreneur, uh, cutting across those industries and running um, a, a business successfully, which uh, from a project into a business accoladed as the biggest um, innovation in Africa. 
that is from EABL, and then uh, jumping on to start uh, also my own businesses. And uh, just uh, last year in 2020, handed over the construction industry to start uh, to jump into fintech. And uh, hopefully, hopefully that is my second last project before leaving Earth and um, having to ask myself quite a number of questions in the process of my existence. And jumping into breweries, uh, back to breweries is, um, I asked question while trying to connect to the consumer of the brand, um, knowing that truly I'm not sending the correct information in the sense that we are telling the consumers responsible drinking while I want, in essence, for them to drink as much as possible so that we can make as much money as possible. And so uh, as a follower of Jesus on one hand and as a seller of alcohol on the other hand, and asking the question about the presentation of alcohol and the church, I think uh, I resorted to start a bar, which is a church. And um, that was in 2007. So the hardest thing, because I look at sustainable projects, I, the profits from the bar would support the ministry. And that has been like, so within the bar, there is a pastor's office, basically to engage men. And the man, the man who was um, described by this brand for my brand communication was a hardworking, irresponsible man. Hardworking, this guy rises up at five, works for two hours to get a job. He's a wager, he may get a, $5 to $10 in a day, then walks for another two hours, lives in a 10 by 10, is married, has a kid or two kids. And so my heart went out to men, looking at men who are not taking their responsibilities in their homes. And so over the last now 14 years, we've managed to reach out to about 400 men. And some of these men have come back into the bar to help other men who are already transformed. And in essence, is just get them out, disciple them. If they decide to join other local churches, so be it. If they decide to come and help, so be it. And out of these, the guys who did for me the interior work so that they could convert the church into a bar um, were students. And uh, one of them, I mentioned to him, just in case you finish school, you're employed, you're tired, look, come and look for me. That time I had left breweries, I was working in a bank. The guy came, you here, hi, you asked me to look for you. And I'm now ready. In 2010, we started a company and that's Sahihi. And so that's my company started from the bar. I had to close so many other businesses that I was doing to focus on this one. Now, which uh, um, celebrated 10 years anniversary last year. And so why I'm here and to share my story is I find myself everywhere I am, asking the question, what can I do for you, God, while I'm in this place? And, um, and so along that journey, I have worked with various communities, and one of them is a Pokot East community, uh, a place in the Bundus, whereby there are always conflict with the neighbors, the Pokot Trukanas and Samburus. These are three communities who are pastoralists, and they are always fighting. And they are fighting for resources. And so it's to work with the leaders, local leaders who are there, so that they can bring a semblance of peace. And some of these would be uh, run for education, so that looking at a generation which would come maybe in 20 years to come, they look at life differently and uh, stop the wars. And uh, that again, for about 16 years, once a year, we go there just to encourage and. Uh, work with the uh, local leaders. And I liked what Njeri talked about the women. We find that uh, because it's so patriarchal kind of a community, women are the ones who are most responsive. But the progress would be so little because there's no support of the men. And I think Ishmael, I hope you can be sharing some of these images uh, of the Pokot East as uh, even as we unfold on this. The other thing is the question again, what can I do while I'm in this place, and I find myself quite uh, busy. Uh, within, um, uh, again, Sahihi, we find that uh, we, over the last uh, three years now, we've been doing a marathon in 
coffee and tea growing areas where you find that the owners of the coffee estates are so rich and the workers are so poor. And uh, in between the iron fisted managers who uh, oversee the poor workers uh, as they work. And uh, there are schools which are domiciled within these estates. And the kids for these poor workers go to these schools, primary school, secondary school, and then they uh, fall back into the same cycle. And so what we do, we engage um, all the three, that is the parents for the kids, the kids themselves, and the, the owners of the farms. And how we do this for the kids, we sponsor two from a marathon, a run that we have once a year, from the money that we raise. We pay for school fees for uh, a bright uh, student uh, who is within those communities who is also poor. And currently we have two, uh, one at uh, a university within Mount Kenya region, another one within the Nairobi uh, area, uh, and one doing IT, the other one doing BA. And these are two different uh, uh, courses, but that has happened for the last two years. This year we didn't have a, a run, but we called it COVID run because it was just the staff. There was no cash award for the, for the, for the winning students. For the estate owners, we plant trees, and for the parents, we train on permaculture because the the land is occupied, the whole land is occupied by coffee or tea, and so there is no room for growing anything. So permaculture would be bugs just outside their small houses and uh, grow some vegetables to supplement on their their other income, basically. And um, that is a green drug, which we do once a year, and that is under our organization. We were at one time responding every Saturday to feed the parking boys, but um, uh, just a barn and some porridge. They are sleeping out in the cold and just something to keep them warm. And these uh, were stopped again by the county government saying, this is their work, you can't help us. I mean, we have homes where we feed these guys, but uh, also the police, there were sources of insecurity because gathering a hundred uh, students uh, or kids, parking boys, would uh, be a good avenue for the drug sellers and they would come and, you know, that would be a good market for them. So again, the police uh, halted that. Uh, with COVID-19, that was last year, we started feeding uh, families, 30 families, every Wednesday uh, in the afternoon. And just this is as a response to the things which are happening within our community. Um, and these 30 families, we, before COVID, already poverty was you know, quite uh, hard on them. And so with COVID, we just put together uh, three kilos of flour, uh, one cabbage, and some just modest cooking fat. And every week we would give, you know, one family. And I think, again, those photos are rolling uh, out there. We would go identify their homes, give them a voucher, then they go to a central place just to collect uh, uh, these. And that would cost only $2. Uh, for the three kilos, it's 150 shillings. A cabbage is 35 bob, and a modest 17 bob, the cooking fat. And I think that would push them maybe three, four days before it runs out and um, they would uh, seek uh, from elsewhere. Uh, in 2014, because of the bar charge, I got identified by Tier Fund UK uh, and a program called Inspired Individuals. And these were people who are doing transformational uh, stuff within their communities. And uh, so I was put into this program. And um, within the program, I met other people around the world who are doing different transformational things. And after the three-year program, I got connected with Kevin. Kevin was the founder of uh, Philemon Foundation. He was imprisoned, released after seven years, started going back to prison with tissues and soap just to take back to the guys who are in prison. And in so doing, uh, Kevin, uh, out of that, started a foundation and a halfway home because someone who is jailed, one, within Kenya, they are not accepted in society just that easily because he's still viewed as a murderer, he's still viewed as a rapist, as a, you know, whatever crime he committed. Yet, this guy may have. Uh, transformed while he was incarcerated. And so uh, after the three years, we were challenged to collaborate. And the collaboration is, Kevin, to look at something that I am good at, 
and I look at something that Kevin is good at, and Kevin comes to Metameta, the bar church, and I go to his prison's ministry, and I help him uh, within his prison's ministry. And so we, I started training the inmates who are about to be released zero to one year on how to start uh, small businesses. And this was because once you're released in Kenya, you cannot be employed by government. And by extension, you can also not be employed, find any uh, job within the private sector. So this guy leaves, and uh, up to 70% of them reoffend to go back to the prisons. Um, and um, so, and again, my focus has been made. It's a reason being because it's hard to, try, to, try, to, to reach out to a man, to transform a man. But once you do, the chances of that man influencing a family is up to five times, as opposed to a lady, which is only 17% of that. And so my focus on spending time with men is to see that these men take go back to the family, take their responsibilities you know, as a provider, uh, securing the family and doing all that men are supposed to do. And so I've done this uh, since 2014, but Kevin left and went back to his hometown. So because it's something that I was loving to do within the business, I went back to the director of the welfare and she allowed me to go in and over the last uh, two years uh, we've done six prisons i do twice a year and the third one just to reinforce and to make sure that when these guys leave they go to start those small businesses so essentially i train them how to start from zero how to start from zero because this girl was married the wife left uh, the kids were was two years old now he's 19 years old he's yes we need to i mean you're doing wonderful work but we, we have to wrap this up i mean it's really getting late in some places um but we appreciate you i mean all the work you do and we of all the panelists we've been posting websites and other contacts if anyone has any questions on how to contact, please post it in the chat box. Uh, but I know we've been doing this about two hours and it's been wonderful. I mean, it's we have such powerful people who are doing such great work and Dr. King would definitely be proud and so would have so many other ancestors for what we're doing. So it's not just history, we're doing things now. So, um, any last words? I don't know if Kim is still on. She's been quiet. Or Delia, <laughs> Haki, you have any well, last she's, words? She's been, she's been listening and advising from the background here. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, yes, <laughs> right. I, I've been, <laughs> I didn't know she wanted to say something, make yeah. her presence known. Oh, God. Maybe, maybe <clears throat> not. Yeah, I put my but, um, uh, websites. Uh, uh, and contact information up. I'm getting ready to put up my um, email address. Oh, great. Thank you, I put, Thank you Bob. I put, it, I put two websites, one for the Pan-African Fellows Movement in North America and my own personal website. And I put up my business card and I'm getting ready to put up my uh, email. This is Brother Amsada, Coordinator Pan-African Fellows Movement in North America. And it's, thank uh, you for the opportunity. This has been a great. Ante Sana. Yes, thank you. It, it has been great. We have learned a lot of history. We know that people are serving their communities, and it's an example for us also to serve in our own. Thank you also, uh, Anokale, for taking this challenge. You've done a fantastic job all the way from Ghana. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. And I thank all the, well, thank the ancestors the most, most high for keeping the internet going strong and going. <laughs> and um, I'd like to thank all the participants who joined us here this afternoon and this evening. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, okay bye. Bye. <laughs>